the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. Lord, we pray to keep thy church and household continually in thy true religion, that they who do lean only upon the hope of thy heavenly grace may evermore be defended by thy mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Verse 5 of hymn 117, an epiphany hymn, which we have for quite a few days, up to 139, and then we'll begin it starting the long trek through Lent to Easter week. Looks like about 15 more hymns for uh, Epiphany. The brightest and best of the stars of the morning dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid. Star of the east, the horizon adorning, guide where our infant redeemer is laid. Well, if we turn our attention to volume two of <clears throat> uh, the flower of this flowers of history by Roger of Wendover, sometimes ascribed to Matthew of Paris, uh, some formerly. So there's some debate about the text. He probably copied it and then extenuated the history. Uh, Roger of Wendover, not sure where he was born, maybe out in Wales, the Brecon area, not sure. But they passed manus manuscripts around among the monasteries. Ah, oh, we're up to 1170, so it's got to have been augmented because... Oh, wait a minute. No, he dies in 1236. I'm sorry. How the nobles of Brittany swore fealty to King Henry and his son Geoffrey. 1170, Henry, King of England, held his court on Christmas Day at Nantes, Nantes with the bishops and barons of Lesser Britain, who all swore, swore fealty to him and to his son Geoffrey. And Lent following, he crossed over into England and was almost drowned with all his people of the absolution of the Bishop of London. There, this year also, Gilbert, Bishop of London, arriving at Milan on his way to Rome. Received there a letter from our Lord the Pope to the following purport. We've commanded the Archbishop of Rouen and the Bishop of Exeter in our stead to receive from you an oath that you will abide by our sentence. <laughs> Touching the causes for which this sentence was passed against you and then to absolve you. I tell you, the, the rank arrogance of Rome so that your excommunication may entail no loss of rank or dignity and mark of infamy upon you hereafter. The bishop therefore succeeded in the object of his wishes and was publicly absolved at ruin on Easter Sunday. This is hilarious. Of the life and virtues of St. Godric the Hermit, this same year, the venerable hermit Godric passed from this life to that which is eternal. Of his life, his miraculous acts, and glorious end, we will here introduce a few remarks, since it would be an injustice to the saint altogether to pass over his glorious deeds. This friend of God was born in Norfolk. His father's name was Aylward, and his mother's Aodwena. He was brought up by his parents in the native village of Walpole, and there passed his life in their company. When he had passed the innocent years of childhood, he became a tradesman. Innocent years of childhood. Do we get a Palasian flavor here? He became a tradesman at first in a humble manner and afterwards frequenting the public market with other traders. One day as he was walking alone upon the shore, 
he found three dolphins cast up by the sea, one of which seemed to be dead, and the other two dying. For humanity's sake, he left those which were alive untouched, but loaded himself with part of that which was dead, and set out to return home. But the tide, beginning to rise as usual, was first over his feet and legs, and at last rose as high as his head. But being strong in faith, he continued to walk along under the water, guided by the Lord, until he reached the dry ground, and delivering the fish to his parents, he told them all that happened to him. Sometimes he would meditate when he was alone upon heavenly things, and say over the Lord's prayer and creed. In his zeal for religion, he went to St. Andrews in Scotland to pray, and with no less devotion went also to Rome. On his return from thence, he joined himself to some merchants, and with them carried on traffic by sea, which brought him so much wealth that he was owner of half of one ship and the fourth part of another. Being robust in body and active in mind, he sailed to different parts of the country, countries of the world, and visiting the holy places of the saints, commended himself to their protection. Of the girl who ministered to St. Godric in his pilgrimage, when Godric had spent 16 years in the gains of these trading voyage voyages, he determined to spend in the cause of religion the wealth which his labors had accumulated. He therefore took the cross and devoutly visited our Lord's sepulchre, after which he returned by way of St. James to England. <clears throat> after some time, he felt a holy desire to visit the threshold of the apostles and communicated this intention to his parents when his mother expressed her wish to accompany him if he would let her. He gladly assented and with filial obedience carried her on his shoulders whenever the roughness of the road required it. When they had passed through London, a woman of great beauty approached them and asked permission to join in their pilgrimage. To this they readily assented, and she adhered to them with great diligence and devotion, for she washed and kissed their feet and served them better than any others. In this manner she conducted herself the whole way, both going and returning. No one asked her who she was, or where she was from, nor did she ever mention it. When they passed through London on their return, she obtained their consent to leave. But she said before going away, it is now time for me to go to the place from which I came, and you must give thanks to God, who never deserts those that put their trust in him. For I tell you that you will surely obtain what you have prayed for at Rome from the apostles. None of the company saw this woman except Godfrey and her mother. How the man of God on his return home retired into the desert. When he had restored his mother in safety to the protection of his father, he sold all that he had, received their blessing, and left them in order to become a hermit. In the extreme parts of England, he came to this city called Carlisle, where finding some of his relations, he obtained one of one of them a present of one of St. Jerome's Psalters, which in time he learned to recite by heart. He then, without the knowledge of his friends, ret retired to the woods, where he lived some time on wild herbs and fruits, and both serpents and wild beasts came and looked on him, but after a time left him without doing any harm. In his desert he spent many days as a hermit, one time on his knees and another time with his hands raised to heaven or prostrate on the ground. He was constantly in prayer to God. At last he found in that place a hermit's cave into which he entered and received the salutation, Welcome, Brother Godric, to which he replied, How do you, how do you do, Father Aelric, though they never knew one another before? You are sent by heaven, replied the old man, to bury my old body when I am dead. These two lived together two years, though neither of them had any property. 
At last, the old hermit became infirm, was carried about by Godric, who brought him food and fetched a priest to hear his confession and administered to him the Eucharist. Godric, therefore, seeing that he became more, said, Thou spirit that hast been created after God's likeness, I adjure thee by the Almighty God not to leave this body without my knowledge. The old man thereupon died immediately, and Godric saw a kind of spherical body like a hot and burning wind, which shone like most transparent glass in the midst of incomparable whiteness, though no one can describe the measure of the soul's qualities. <clears throat> the news of the holy man's death, his companions, who were at the court of St. Cuthbert, where when a young man he himself had resided, buried him in the cemetery of Durham. How the blessed Godric went to Jerusalem and returned safe. When the brother aforesaid was buried, Godric returned to the desert, doubting what might be the divine will concerning him. Whilst therefore he was praying earnestly to God on this subject, a voice came from heaven saying, It is expedient that thou shouldst go to Jerusalem and return again. Also St. Cuthbert, Christ's holy confessor, appeared to him saying, Go to Jerusalem and be crucified with the Lord, and I will be there your helper and patron in all things. When you've completed this journey, you shall serve God under my protection at Finchale, Finchale, Finchale. Godric, returning to Durham, took the cross and received the priest's blessing. On this journey, he ate nothing but barley bread and drank water. He neither changed nor washed his clothes, nor ever took off his shoes to change or mend them until he arrived as, as the holy places. When he came to the Lord's tomb and other sacred places, he prayed devoutly, shedding tears and kissing the spot so long devoutly that one could hardly have thought it possible. He then went to the River Jordan, where, clothed in sackcloth and with a cup which he carried in his wallet and a small cross which he always bore in his hand. He entered the river which he af always after loved. And there putting off his clothes came forth washed and cleaned. But he threw away his shoes and said, Almighty God, who in this land didst walk with naked feet and did suffer thy feet to be pierced with nails upon the cross. Henceforth I will never again wear shoes. Having thus fulfilled his vow of pilgrimage, he returned to England. We're still on 1170. How the blessed Godric, by God's inspiration, chose his residence at Finchail. Returned from pilgrimage, he found a secret place in a forest in the north of England called Exdale, which he thought would suit him to dwell in. He accordingly built a hut of logs, covering it with turf, and dwelt there a year and some months. But when the proprietors of the land began to annoy him, he left it and went to Durham, where he made such rapid progress in learning the Psalter afresh that he soon knew as much of the Psalms, hymns, and prayers as he thought sufficient. Wherefore, one day, inspired from on high, he went into a grove in the neighborhood where he heard a shepherd say to his comrade, let us go and water our flocks at Finchale. Godric, hearing these words, gave the shepherd the only penny he had to conduct him to that place. As he proceeded towards the interior of the forest, there he met him a fierce wolf of an extraordinary size, which rushed upon him as if it would tear him to pieces. Godric, perceiving that this was one of the wiles of the old enemy, made the sign of the cross, saying, I adjure thee in the name of the Holy Trinity to depart with speed. If the service which I propose to discharge to God in this place is acceptable to him. These words, the animal prostrated himself with his impious feet as if begging pardon of the holy man. How St. Godric at Finchale 
dwell among the wild beasts and serpents. Intending, therefore, to serve the Lord in this place, Godric, by license of Ralph, Bishop of Durham, formed a cave in the earth near the bank of the river Ware, and covering it with turf, resided therein among the wild beasts and serpents. The number of serpents was fearful, but they were all tamed towards the man of God, suffering themselves to be handled and obedient to his commands. Sometimes as he sat by the fire, they would twine around his legs and coil themselves up in his dish or his cup. And having passed some years in this way of life, he thought that the serpents impeded his prayers. Wherefore, one day, seeing them about him as usual, he commanded them to enter the house no more, upon which all those vermin wholly left and never crossed the threshold. When also presents of food and other articles were offered to him, he declines them altogether, preferring to live by the labor of his hands, and he burnt boughs and branches of trees to ashes, which he mixed with the barley flour in such proportion that the ashes formed one-third of the whole, and he restrained the passions of his body by weeping, watching, and fasting so that sometimes even after he passed six days without eating. And tempting him strongly with luxury, the devil appeared to him in the form of a wild beast, such as a bear, lion, bull, or wolf, a fox, or a toad, and endeavored to alarm him. But he was strong in faith and despised them all. To quench the burnings of the flesh, he subdued his body by the use of the harshest sackcloth, and for fifty years wrote a coat, wore a coat of mail. His table was a broad flat stone on which stood his bread, such as I have before described, but he never tasted it until he was compelled by absolute necessity. His drink was a moderate draught of water, and only when urged by extreme thirst. He never reposed in a bed, but would lie on the ground when he was fatigued with his sackcloth under him and with his head reclining on the stone which served him for a table. When the moon shone, he devoted himself to his works and shaking off sleep, spent time in prayer. In winter, amid snow and hail, he entered the river naked. And there during the whole night, offered himself a living victim to the Lord immersed up to his neck, and in this state poured forth psalms, prayers, and tears. Uh, this would be an interesting case study for psychiatrists. What in the world is to be attained by all of this, living in a world which God has blessed us with? And yet so magnified here by Roger of Wendover, this is really hagiography. How St. Godric one day saw a child come forth from the mouth of the crucifix and reverently settle himself in the bosom of its mother. One day while the man of God was sitting in his oratory repeating the Psalter, he saw a little boy come out of the mouth of the crucifix who going to the image of the Blessed Virgin which stood at the north end of the same plank sat himself in her bosom. She, on the other hand, stretching out her hands to meet him, fondled him in her arms for nearly three hours. The boy during the whole time moved as if he was alive, and both when he came and when he went, the image of the Virgin trembled so much that the plank seemed likely to fall. Godric thought that the limbs of the image were filled with the spirit of life. How our Lord's mother and Mary Magdalene appeared to St. Godric and of the song which our Savior's mother taught him. This is, you know, sorry, the canon doesn't suffice. It's not sufficient. It's inadequate. Another time when the man of God was praying before the altar of the Blessed Virgin Mother of God. So where's this altar coming from? In his little cave in the side of the Ware River. 
He saw two girls of tender age and of the utmost beauty standing at the two horns of the altar and clothed in garments of snowy whiteness. Now, how does Roger of Wendover get all these details? They stood some time looking at one another, and Godric did not dare to move, but turned his eyes from one to the other and occasionally bowed his head in adoration. And how do we know these are not psychogenically induced by the terrible way he tra treated his body and mind and his diet? The virgins then approached him, and she who was at the right hand of the altar asked him, Dost thou know me, Godric? To whom he answered, that is impossible, lady, except to whom you design to reveal yourself. She replied, of a truth thou hast said that I am the mother of Christ, and through me thou shalt obtain his grace. See, just here's where we are. Old Testament, New Testament, systematics, church history, which we're doing, practical, contemporary theology. This, the first three disciplines just... Throwing this out. This is craziness. You wouldn't tell your children to live like this. I commit myself to thee, my lady, and beseech thee to take me under thy protection. She then placed both of her hands on his head and smoothing down his hair, filled the house with sweet odor. After this, she sang and taught Godric to sing a song which he afterwards often repeated and imprinted it firmly on his memory. The song of the English idiom is as follows. St. Mary, Clain Virgin, Motor Jesu, Christ Nazarene, Onfoskyle, help him, Thin Godric, Onfang, bring Healy with the Godrich, St. Mary, Christ's Boar, Boar, Maiden's Clenbed, Motorous flower, deliver in my sin and regna in my mind. Bring me to bless with thyself, God. Religious poetry. The song may thus be rendered in Latin. Santa Maria, Virgo Munda, Mater Jesu Christi Nazarena, Ni Suscipa, a duke, Santa Tecum in Dei Regnum, Sancta Maria Christi Thalamus, Virginalis Puritas, Matris Flos, Della Mea Crimina, Regna in Menta Mea, Duke Me Ad Felicitatum Cum Solo Deo. This song Christ's mother told Godric to sing whenever he was fearful of being overcome by pain sorrow or temptation and when you call on me by singing it continued she you shall immediately have my help she then made the sign of the cross upon his head and in his sight went up to heaven leaving behind a pleasant odor how saint godric raised two dead persons to life one one day there came to the man of god a husband and wife and besought him mercifully to restore to life their daughter, who was dead. And at the same time, they produced her body from a sack, which they brought with them. The man of God, judging himself unworthy to perform such a meritorious deed, made no answer, but went into the field to his unusual labor, at which the two persons were disturbed and took their departure leaving the body in his oratory. For, they said, he may keep the corpse and bury it, or else restore it to life, which he could do if he pleased. In the evening, Godric, returning, found the body in the corner of his oratory and immediately began devoutly praying to God to bring the girl back to life. This he continued for three days and two nights, when on the third day, whilst he was still lying prostrate before the altar, he saw the girl advance toward it, upon which he forthwith called her parents and restored her to their cares, making them at the same time swear that so long as he lived, they would reveal this secret to no one. At another time also, when the dead body of a boy was brought by his parents privately to the man of God, 
he bade them place it on the altar of the Blessed Virgin in his oratory, saying, Do not suppose that the boy is dead, but kneel down with me and entreat the divine mercy for the child. When they prayed, he told them to go and take the boy from the altar, which when they went to do, they found him alive and smiling. <clears throat> the man of God afterwards bound them by oath not to reveal this deed to anyone as long as they should be alive. And here we'll call this to an end. Epiphany Hymn 118 Brightest and best of the stars of the morning Dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid Star of the east, the horizon adorning Guide where our infant redeemer is laid Brightest and best of the stars of the morning Dawn on our darkness and lend us thy aid Star of the east, the horizon adorning guide where our infant redeemer is laid. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.